motorboat's wedged itself right into the bayou. If I get the motor started, I could try reversing back into the river. Jeremy, where are you?
The winch is powered by electricity. I need to find a way to turn it on before I can use it.
looks pretty weak. I just need something to... This definitely needs fuel.
Thirty years ago, Frederick needed me to die. You're not making any sense, Jeremy. Come back. Find hey. your focus. Hey! I cheated everyone. I didn't play my part. Hey! I escaped hey. my doom. My destiny. Again, find hey. your focus. Hey, I'm right here. What the hell is going on? Now everything is wrong. Nothing is in hey. place. I'm right here! Calm down, Mr. Conby. What do you want? Did... Were you... Were you not talking to Jeremy right now? I haven't seen Jeremy all day. Are you all right, Detective? No. Actually, actually, I don't... I don't think so. Well, maybe. I'm gonna go... Look for Jeremy. Good. Let me know if you find him. That was Jeremy's self-deceit, a steamboat stuck in the mud? I'm not going to pretend I understand any of that. What a bunch of psychoanalytic nonsense. Detective, am I glad to see you. Lock the door, will you? I don't think Dr. Gray would appreciate us snooping around. What's going on here? This feels so strange. Have you found anything? What? Y yeah, uh, yeah, I've seen some things. Okay, let me know if there is anything you want to talk about. What did you do? I was just 
rearranging the books. Well, come on, let's check it out. I think I'm beginning to understand. Dr. Gray is dealing with some kind of mass delusion. Good to finally meet you, Mr. Hartwood. I'm here on the behalf of your brother, Philip. You were expecting me, weren't you? Yes. You're from the Seattle, no? That's right. I just wanted to ask you a few questions to see if there is anything I can do to help you and your family. Okay. I understand you're full of imagination. You make up a lot of things. I suppose. And you obsess over them. Blurring reality and fiction. Sometimes. Do you want to tell me about the Dark Man? No. No, I, I don't. That's all right. Perhaps there is something else you can tell me. Something you know to be made up, but you hold dear. Juan? John? Who's John? No. Juan Luis Jorge. Wait there a moment. Here. Take a look. Is he... Oh, he is the author. It's a magnificent book. Life-changing, even. The real one is long dead, but I like to think of him as my, my friend. My most beloved friend. I see. Do you often do this? Fantasize about people you read about? No. No. Well, there is Jacob. Who is Jacob? Turn to the last page. Oh, it's a newspaper article. The Prisoner of Ice, Jacob Van Ostart. Is he also your beloved friend? Oh, no, Doctor. Not at all. He is the fire that fights fire. Yes, I think it's clear your overstimulated imagination, this mania, needs to be tempered for you to live a normal life. I know your family calls it the Hartwood Curse, but I want you to know that there is nothing supernatural about your condition. It's all inside your head. And with that, I'm very qualified to deal with. In time, you will be cured. In time, in time. Yes, in time we will exercise all your demons, all the dark men. Yeah! Please, Mr. Hartwood, calm yourself. What happened? Oh, don't you worry your little head about it, Miss Hartwood. Your uncle and I just had our first breakthrough. What were you saying about mass delusion? Dorsetto seems to have a deranging effect on people living close by. It has a history of creating cults devoted to some nature goddess. Even the name Dorsetto refers to the cult existing here before the Civil War. Dorsetto was the name of an ancient fertility goddess worshipped in Syria. Dr. Gray and his friends, however, seem to prefer... the black goat of the woods with a thousand young, or Shubnigroth. And that name can only have come from my uncle's twisted mind. That mark on the floor looks like talisman positions, but from which direction should I look at it? The Snake Dagger, a monograph by Yael Klein. In Ludwig Prinz's book on pagan rituals called The Mystery of the Grave, as translated by Nicholas Vahi, there are several references to a sacrificial dagger called the Snake Dagger. It has long been thought of as a poor translation of the original text, that it would be more appropriate with Worm Dagger from the Latin Vermis Cultrum. This seems natural following the recent consensus that the original title of Prince book, The Vermis Mysteris, should literally translate to the Mystery of the Worm. 
However, this would take away from Vahi's great effort at translating the underlying meaning of the words and revealing several cultural beliefs. While Prin certainly was using the term worm as a symbol or synecdoche for death and the dead, which is made clear by the contents of the book, in the case of the dagger, we shouldn't be too hasty to dismiss his translation. Reading through Vahi's correspondence with his patron, it appears that he had more than just the Latin text at his disposal. Vahi had dug up Prin's living relatives and uncovered several cross-referenced historical texts and an actual snake dagger. The dagger was dated to the early Middle Kingdom of Egypt and had such a clear shape of a wave that Vahi considered calling it the sinusoidal blade. Knowing the full story, it seems prudent that he chose to translate it as snake and not worm. There are several reasons why this choice of word helps us understand the pagans that Prin's book attempts to describe. The symbolic value of the shape becomes more apparent when reading about the use for the dagger. In the passage of possession and exorcism, we find the snake dagger poisons the poisoner within the victim and is therefore pacified. Where the literal text would tell us that the worm dagger trumps the demon possessing the victim, it tells us nothing of their reasoning only that somehow this dagger wins against the demon, like it had the better hand in poker. Vahi's translation allows us to follow the underlying logic to the ritual magic that is being performed. Poison the poisoner. Sounds like fighting fire with fire. That to hurt the demon possessing its victim, the priests would have to fight back with a power that is known to the evil they are fighting. The snake dagger is therefore not only a good way to describe its form, but it also helps us understand how it could be thought of as a useful tool for exorcism. Finally, it also helps us understand their relationship to lunacy, that it was thought of as something poisoning the mind rather than controlling it. What is also interesting to note is that the possessed are always considered poisoned in their head and not their heart. The snake dagger always went to the eye of the possessed, leaving them partially blind, if they had the good luck to survive. Has that been there this whole time? You think all of them are in this cult business? Even Jeremy? I'm not sure any of them have a choice at this point. We just need to find a way to stop all of this. so busy trying to free your uncle from the promise he made to the dark man, I guess I kind of just let everything else go. Don't worry, detective. I feel like we're close. I'm sure Jeremy will turn up. If he is part of the cult, he wouldn't want to miss the Feast of St. John. I just need enough information to make him see the truth. I hope you're right, but I doubt he'll show up. Not as long as the dark man's got him hiding. Hello? It, it, it can't be. Who is this? 
Jeremy? Jeremy is with the Dark Man. You can't save him. Well, I've done everything he wanted so far, and there's just one more thing on the list. I expect him to keep his promise and return Jeremy unharmed. Get out, detective. While you still can. You okay? You look a little frazzled. Just... stupid telephone. I know. I tried calling the police earlier. The telephone is completely dead. It's not... Yeah, no, the telephone isn't working. Miss Hartwood, I think you're gonna want to see this. Is there something in the closet? Yeah, there is. You don't see the very obvious gate leading to... Whatever Jeremy's madness is serving up next? I don't understand. Are you making some kind of fashion metaphor? I'm sorry, I don't have time for this. Can you just tell me what you're doing? You don't see this. It's fine. It's fine. Catch you later. Are you going inside the closet? Yeah. You got a problem with that? No. Do what you think is right, detective. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Goodbye, Miss Harwood.
We found the ancient Stellarium perched on a cliff facing the Arctic Ocean after a day of sailing due north of the Eskimo encampment. Jacob van Ostadt was our most keen member of the expedition. He had been chasing down the source of a peculiar type of crystallized metal present in several sacred items among the natives on the northeast coast of Greenland. The site was a remarkable find for any explorer, and we were all enraptured in our search for enlightenment and meaning. The surviving architecture seemed almost unearthly in origin and astonishingly sophisticated. The metal Jacob was searching for was abundant, almost ubiquitous. We were so taken by our find that we were surprised by the sun falling below the horizon. As we quickly picked up our gear, ready to head back to our camp, Jacob von Ostadt declared that he wanted to stay. He was adamant. We begged him to reconsider. The night would be getting colder by the hour, and we feared for all our safety. Jacob refused, threatening us with violence if we wouldn't leave him alone. As the snowfall turned heavier, we left him there on his own. The next day the weather became worse, and we had to spend hours enforcing our shelter as our tents became increasingly useless. The group had written off Jacob, thinking he must be dead. I had an urge to make one final attempt to save him, so I headed out as darkness fell with a handful of flares and headed toward the coast and up the climb towards the Stellarium. That's when I saw him, transfixed by a burning sky, that celestial lantern. Jacob keeled over and let out a painful shriek that struck me with such fear and pity. He was crying in agony, for the cold weather had ravaged his flesh. I called out to him, and he turned to face me. His vacant stare held me in place like a needle through a butterfly, and he said, You must leave now, Ashton. Go, and never come back. And so I left.
Hey, you! What are you doing here? What is this place? Turn back, detective. You're not wanted here. Whoa, take it easy. I'm not your enemy. Oh, you're wrong, detective. You're wrong. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
God's sake, stay dead, will you?
awake? You are awake. Mr. Conby's up. Hey, buddy. I thought you'd be knocked out for the rest of the night. <laughs> Come on out and join us, will you? I'll save you some gumbo. Good to have you back. You gave us all a good scare. What happened? You had a psychological breakdown. Sorry for manhandling you, but you were being violent, you see. You stabbed Jeremy and then punched Dr. Gray. Are they... okay? Jeremy's a little strange, but everything's back to normal. Really? All thanks to you, Combat. You want to try standing up? Well, if it isn't the hero of the day. How are you feeling, Detective? Never better. How about you two? Hey, Jeremy, I didn't do too much damage, did I? Things are fine. Very quiet. What's up with him? Painkillers? No. You see, despite you having the finesse of a one-eyed butcher, you managed to lobotomize, dear Jeremy. I did what? It's actually quite impressive. It's not like I hadn't considered it myself. I just wish Jeremy could have been helped without reducing his personality to that of an oyster. But he's gonna live. Of course. As long as someone keeps feeding him, he'll outlive the best of us. Does Emily know about Jeremy's condition? Yes. She seems to be handling it quite well under the circumstances. Hey, Ruth. Glad to see you made it back to Dorsetto. You too, Detective. Make sure to stay for the festivities. It's no Mardi Gras, but it ain't bad. Good to see you back on your feet, Detective. Have some gumbo. Thanks. I'll save it for later. What are you looking for? Just keeping an eye out, Port Stone. Radio says it could be a wild one. All right, tell me, what the hell's about to happen here? Every year we have a little turn-the-page ceremony by the tree. It's symbolical. Symbol... It's like life has its cycles of grief and happiness. You know? Just like a tree facing the seasons. Things change, but remain the same. That is one impressive tree. More impressive than you could ever imagine. Hey, kid. What are you up to? Preparing for the ceremony. I don't want to disappoint Mother. What's your part in this? I'm the Cabri San Corn. It's very important. Only I can settle our debt. You know, I had my doubts, but you are in the right place, Grace. I think you might be right. For once.
So how does this all work? You dance around chanting? For the ritual, I mean? Stay and find out, detective. It might just do you good. You haven't seen Emily, have you? No, detective. I haven't. So this is basically New Year's Eve, but with a tree metaphor. Exactly. You're so smart. It's about starting again. I mean... Who could use a positive message like that and more than a bunch of lunatics like us? I get the feeling some of you think this year is going to be special. Any idea why? Well, we got some new words, thanks to your buddy Jeremy, and some other changes to the program. Let's just say... We're all in this year. Seems like everyone's in a pretty good mood. The Eve of St. John is the most important date of the whole year. It's the only day when the black goat of the woods tends to her young. I'm gonna go look for Emily. Don't worry about her. She wouldn't leave without you, would she? You don't know where Emily is, do you? She's packing some of Jeremy's things. Said she wanted to take him away. I'm sure she'll come and get you when she's ready. I should probably get a move on then. See you around, compare. Does she still want to take Jeremy away from Dorsetto? I will have to insist that you do. This is not that kind of institution. Jeremy, hang on for a little longer, okay? We'll be going back to New Orleans soon. Oh, good. I do so miss the city lights. Case closed. Detective Convy had found Jeremy and brought him back to Dorsetto. He worried that Emily wouldn't be all that happy with his performance, considering Jeremy's impromptu brain surgery. Maybe she would refuse to pay him in full. It was the kind of thought that would normally infuriate Conby, but right now he just felt happy to be back. No matter if he would be seeing the $150 or not, he couldn't wait to rendezvous with Emily and go back to New Orleans. Everyone knows what to do? Y'all know the new words. Mrs. Thompson, we talked about this. I'm not sure everyone is comfortable. Doctor, I insist. This is important. We've waited for so long, Doctor. Let's just go with the old song. Not every change is an improvement. Boss, good or bad, he needs to move forward. All in, Doc. Let's bet it all. But we don't know what we're dealing with. It'll be okay, Doctor. Even. Hell, there are praises in abundance to the black goat of the woods. Hear us, brother. Take pity on us. 
take pity on us. Ever Here there is no end of life on the black black take pity on us. Hear us, Mama, and take pity on us. Take pity on us. Are you crazy? This is what he's the happy coffee. Stop! Stop! Detective, get my uncle out of here. Jeremy, come with me. Get over here. Jeremy, come with me. Jeremy, come here. No, there has to be enough of us. We're I can't let that monster leave Dorsetto. I have to stop it. <laughs> 